Welcome to this uh, interfaith lecture of our Listening to Other Voices series. Uh, we apologize that we had to cancel our February uh, lecture, uh, first because of a snowstorm and then because of illness. But we're back on track now, and we are glad that you're here to share with us. Uh, we have many things going on here at Glastonbury. I'm, I'm one of the monks, in case some of you don't know who I am. <laughs> I guess it's obvious. <laughs> and I'm a member of the uh, lecture committee. There's nine of us. Uh, I'm the token monk, and they're all lay people. <laughs> And there, we have great discussions as we prepare this series as we are now doing for next year. Uh, the lecture series is one of many programs that go on at the Abbey. If you have not received a copy of our Institute booklet, uh, you can find out what else is still going on in, in the months ahead. We have classes, we have lectures, we have scripture lessons, um, but this is a particular dimension of our ministry this interfaith lecture series, which is now in its 15th year. Um, Benedictine monks go back to the 5th century, before Mohammed. <laughs> <laughs> but not too far before. Um, the Vatican Rome has asked us particularly to be involved in interfaith discussions because we predate a lot of the divisions in the among Christians particularly, of the East and West, Protestants, um, we are in a kind of position to share more ancient kind of forms of spirituality. So we find this a, a great challenge and an opportunity to share this with you and to uh, invite speakers from different traditions. One of the wonderful things of this series is that uh, we find out after listening to other traditions what ours is really about. It clarifies for you what you believe. It's really a gift to hear people coming from other traditions uh, speaking about God, uh, love, or all the ingredients that belong to all uh, religions, really. So it is a great privilege for us to host uh, this series. I'm going to turn this over very soon to uh, Lord to introduce our speaker. Good evening. Pluralism. The existence within a nation or society of groups distinctive in ethnic origin, origin, cultural patterns, religion, or the like. A policy of favoring the preservation of such groups within a given nation or society. That's from Webster's New World Dictionary. We don't hear that word or concept so much today we're more likely to hear about extremism and extremists. Our speaker was, for many years, spiritual leader of the Alfaro Mosque in Lower Manhattan. Are you still leader there? No. Okay. Uh, focused on serving Muslims, but also on bringing together others who are not Muslim. Uh, interfaith, intercommunity activities. After 9-11 in 2003, he created the Cordoba Initiative as a multicultural space for people to come together in mutual trust, support, dialogue, to learn about each other. In 2010, he had a plan to build a community center with a prayer space in Lower Manhattan. And as a result of that, he became known as the Ground Zero uh, Imam. You've probably heard that expression. <laughs> but his target has been extremism. He's been criticized strongly, both from both sides of the political religious spectrum. Internationally, he's internationally known for his moderation as a thinker, writer, speaker. And moderation is probably the word he most favors these days. Uh, he's featured on all the major TV. Uh, networks. He has spoken at churches, synagogues, universities, and worked with governments here and abroad. He's written numerous articles for both liberal and conservative uh, publications, and also has written editorials for those same publications. 
He's written four books, and the most recent is his book, Moving the Mountain, which Father Timothy just showed you. Uh, he's received many um, awards, most recently the Common Ground Award. Um, his resume, which I don't have with me, is nine pages long. <laughs> there's a description in the program you have tonight, and there's also a website if you want more information. So his topic uh, tonight is spirituality in the face of extremism. Imam Faisal Abdul Rauf, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Father Timothy. Thank you very much, Loretta, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here on a very, very cold mm -hmm. night which is bracketed by a few spring days that we have experienced. Um, I have a daughter that lives here in Worcester, and I have tried to drive up, but she said, Dad, the forecast is falling for four to six inches of snow. So until last night, I was still hoping to be able to drive up to see her, but, uh, you know, man disposes and God disposes. Man disposes rather than God disposes. It's wonderful to be here, and I'm delighted to be here. I... Um, discussed me for Muslims to begin when they begin an event or a session or lecture by, by first invoking the name of, of God. God, the Lord, the creator of the heavens and the earth, uh, the one God of all of the prophets as we believe, the God of Adam and Noah, the God of Abraham and Moses and Jesus, and the, and the, the prophet, the, the God of Muhammad, peace and blessings, as we say, upon all of these noble prophets and messengers. I would like to begin by telling you my story. I was born in Kuwait of Egyptian parents. At the age of a year and a half, my father was sent to England, and I grew up there for five years, brought up on, you know, fish and chips and malt vinegar. For those of you who have some familiarity with that cuisine in the post-war, post-World War, post -war, post War II years, and at the age of six, in 1955, my father was sent to Malaya, which is now known as Malaysia, which most of you did not know until the flight MH370, uh, where I think it has brought Malaysia on the map, although in the most unfortunate manner. I lived there for 10 years. At the age of 16, I finished high school, came back to Egypt for a year, where my parents were, and then my father was transferred to New York. And uh, I came to New York at the age of 17. I think it was December 22nd, 1965, as the boat I rode in, we rode in, sailed into New York Harbor and landed on West 52nd Street Pier. It was a cold winter morning like, like today, and um, I just knew, because I, during the, the 10 days of uh, traveling across the Mediterranean Atlantic, I had certain, what I call them, <coughs> visions as to what my life in America was going to be, and what my purpose was going to be. But, the, um, but I came here in, in 1965, 66, went to, began my year at Columbia University, class of 69, and I um, came of age during the time which I'm sure many of you here came of age as well. The uh, Vietnam War years, the uh, Timothy Leary uh, years, uh, the um, sexual revolution, the Beatles, when I can say, get back Loretta to Loretta in the story. Um, but for me, it was a very uh, rudderless time. I, I came here, I didn't know who I was, what I was. Was I an Egyptian? Was I an Englishman? Was I an American to be? Was I an Egyptian and a Malay? Each of these parts of my culture internally and of my psychology and my makeup were things that I loved and respected, and like anyone in any country, had, though has legitimate criticisms about the policies of, or the leadership of any particular given government or country. So I felt like Humpty Dumpty, internally, psychologically, and trying to fit the pieces together. So it took me a while. And in, in the process of this journey, which I write about in my book, the question was, who was I? What, what was Faisal? Of 
course, we used to have long sessions with our fellow students in the middle of the night, asking the question of what is our purpose in life, etc. But I felt that unless I could get and wrap my head around my fundamental identity, and because I'd grown up in different countries, and my mother used to keep an album, I noticed that if you could see that physically I was different every few years, I changed physically. So I was not the same person physically. Um, my ambitions also evolved when I was growing up in England. I wanted to be the proverbial train driver like every young English boy. Uh, um, and then by the time of maybe eight, nine, I wanted to be, uh, I think in succession, an actor, uh, a, a film star, a uh, musician, one after another, then a scientist. Because people would ask me, Faisal, what do you want to be when you grow up? So, you know, I was, Malaysia is a British colony. We studied Shakespeare in high school and the famous line, to be or not to be, that was the question. And that was my quest, you know, so what was the nature? And I realized that the question that made, made many people were asking me, what do you want to be, Faisal, when you grow up, was the wrong question. What they were asking me was, what do you want to do? And I realized I could do different things. But it underlined the question of being. Who am I? What did I really want to be? And what is the meaning of my being? What is the meaning of being human? Uh, so my physiology changed, my ambitions changed, my emotions changed. When I was six years old, I had a mad crush on my teacher. When she got married, I felt jilted. <laughs> the first time I experienced that feeling of rejection. I thought she liked me. I thought she loved me. But she did, but you know, at that age, you have, you have these certain projections that you make. And then one after another, you have a crush on another girl. And then within a year or two years, what was I thinking about? I have a crush on another girl. It's something we laugh about until even my, in my adult years, I had, made a, had experienced, and I met a woman who experienced also, whom I was involved with, what I call the mortality of our emotional attachments. Where I woke up one day, suddenly, overnight, and felt like this woman, whom I had, was madly in love with, had some power, took a vacuum cleaner into my heart, and just sucked all the emotion out. I didn't, I didn't hate her, I didn't love her. It's like all of a sudden, the feeling was gone. I don't know if I ask for a show of hands, have anybody here experienced this <laughs> in their lives? But the, the notion that even my emotional attachments had a, an expiry date, it made me think then, if my body, my, what I did, my ambitions, my emotions were all subject to change. Why did I still have this absolute utter conviction that I was still the same person? Where did this conviction come from? Why do I still feel that that I, that capital I, is still the same? And this is what, what nudged me and prodded me along my spiritual journey, in addition to my own experiences with my religiosity. I was brought up in a religious family, so I learned to perform the rituals of my faith. But there's a formula that we Muslims do in our five-time ritual prayer. We say, I bear witness that there is no God but God, and I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of God. And every time I said that, I had heard a voice in my heart saying, Faisal, you're a bloody hypocrite. <laughs> you're mouthing these words, but you don't know God, you haven't seen God, and you're saying something that I've actually witnessed, the reality of God. So I remember asking my dad once over the said, doesn't the word ashadu mean to see, to bear witness? He said, yes, Faisal. Well, doesn't ashadu an la ilaha illallah means I bear witness that there is no God? Said, yes, Faisal. And the dad, I haven't seen God yet. I, I feel that my prayer is, is, is not real. It's like I'm like a parrot parroting words. 
And this nudged me on my spiritual search, my spiritual journey, and um, until I finally had that, that what, um, what we all call an act of grace, where God touches you. At that moment, you feel you are in the presence of the Almighty, in the presence of a power that is absolute, that is absolutely compassionate, all-knowing, all-powerful, and you know in that moment, just like you know when you've fallen in love, that God exists. That there is a relationship, a covenantal relationship, between the Creator and me as, the, as its creature. And that I have to abide by a set of obligations that comes from that relationship. So I moved on the spiritual path, and that became part of my work, part of my, my, my learning, part of my study. And as I uh, imbibed from the spiritual legacy of my heritage, I began to feel my religiosity get increasingly grounded. And this is why I'm happy to be here today and delighted specifically to be hosted by the Benedictines and the monks who have devoted their lives to the first commandment of loving God, as Jesus says. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord, your God, with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your strength, and another gospel with all of your soul. Actually, all of your soul. All of it, I think it's, in two gospels, if you collate them together, you get heart, mind, soul, and strength. Now, spiritual teachers actually have taught us in my tradition, that the human being is an amalgam of a physical body, an intellect or mind, a heart or a seat of our emotional being, and a soul or a spirit, which is really the locus of our fundamental self, our eternal self, the timeless self. And it is in that, in that soul where the image of God, imago dei, as you call it in, in the Christian vocabulary lies and it's in that image of God that we are created and it's in, the, in that we call it the breath of divine the Quran speaks of it as God breathing into Adam of his own spirit and it's in that locus that not only our timeless eternal or co-eternal or semi-eternal rather than more accurate sense of self and identity and ego lies it is in that that our religious and spiritual imperative comes from and emanates from. It is that which defines us as humans in the highest meaning of the, of the term. And our obligation or our responsibility or our mandate, our divine mandate, is as, as ambassadors or as stewards of the divine, of the creator, is to fulfill that particular part of our being. And there's a language and a vocabulary that has been written by many spiritual masters who have spoken and have written and thought about these things. A language that actually speaks to the underlying unity of faith traditions, that speaks from an experiential point of view about this, because that is where not only the great, most important part of our interfaith dialogue and understanding lies, but it is, that is the basis the common language which helps us translate from the vocabulary of different faith traditions just as we translate from different languages, English into French, into German, into Japanese and so forth. Because a lot of the arguments that exist among people of different faith traditions is not that much different from people who argue as whether it is love or amor, or agape, or eros, you can argue with the words. But once you have actually experienced the reality of that, that is transformative. And that is what enables us to go beyond the limitations of language. Because if our experience is bounded just by the vocabulary of a particular language, we're unable to translate from one to the other. And the path and the duty and the obligation of interfaith dialogue, its objective, is to enable us to see, as Father Timothy says, because when we understand 
another language. It doesn't mean that we forget our own. When we understand French and Latin and German, we actually get a deeper appreciation of the English language. And, and the same thing happens when we study other faith traditions. You will find that perhaps some things are better said in Latin, better said in French, better said in German, better said in English. But English is our language, the language of our culture, the language of our heritage, the language that we're comfortable with, and the language that we use. But there's also a value in, in, in scriptural language. I remember when I had come, it was just Vatican II, and the, the decision was made that Catholics could now perform the Mass in the vernacular. And I know many Catholic friends of mine who felt that they, they lost something from that. The idea of a sacred scripture, an idea of a common language and scripture which would, would bond all Catholics across different vernaculars together in a common bond. And until today, I understand there are still people who insist on performing the Mass in, 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 in Latin. But again, that it goes to the purpose of having a common language or a deeper language which is based on a common set of experiences, which is why I'm so happy to be here this evening. My work in the United States involves, to a large extent, the translation, I can use that word guardedly, of Islam into the American context. And this work is something which is part of not only my tradition, but part of our own, all of our respective traditions. Because, take Christianity, for example, when Jesus Christ preached in Palestine, his followers spread the gospel, and you've had actually different churches with actual nationalistic definitions. You have the Egyptian church, called the Coptic church. You have the Syrian, the Greek, the Russian Orthodox churches. When, the, when finally Rome succumbed to Christianity, you had the Roman Catholic Church. And as Christianity spread to different countries, you'd see even the churches named after a particular country, after a particular tradition. You have the Dutch Reformed Church, the Anglican Church, the Swedish Church, and now in America we have the Baptist churches, the American churches. But even in terms of Catholicism, when Christianity came to America, even Catholics and Protestants, I mean the Anglicans came here, they made some changes. So the Anglican Church became the Episcopal Church. And as Catholics came here, what I'm saying is that an American Catholicism emerged, unique in its own character and way to America, to what America is all about. The same thing has happened with my tradition. When Islam spread from Arabia, to what is considered now majority Muslim countries like Egypt, like Persia, like Byzantium, modern Turkey. In each of these countries, it assimilated and integrated the cultural norms, the legal norms of that particular society. This has happened with every religion. And, as a, as, and that process is important for two reasons. One reason is because when a tradition migrates to another country, it is first seen as something alien, as something different, as something that, you know, like an alien body, you know, there's a tendency to reject this intrusion. It is only after a while that the process of assimilation, the process of translating it into the norms, the thinking modes of that particular group, that it takes root in that society. The other, the other part of that development, of that narrative, is that when that takes place, the religion then is not seen as something alien, but as something native to who we are. In the beginning, Christianity was an alien thing in Rome. But today you go to Rome, you talk about Christianity, they don't think of it as a Palestinian religion. 
Think of they think it was an Italian, a Roman. It is the Roman Catholic Church. So Rome is an Italian religion. You go to you go to Anglicans, they think of Christianity as an English religion. The same thing with Islam. You go to Egypt, you go to Turkey, you go to Iran. They don't think of Islam as an Arab religion. Egyptian was think of an Egyptian religion. Turks think of it as a Turkish religion. There was no Pakistan 80 years ago, but Pakistans think Pakistanis think of Islam as a Pakistani religion today. So this is something which is part of the religious tradition, and it's part of the what I call the assignment of <clears throat> of the community that is now one of the more recent communities in America. And I learned a lot by studying and from my friends with rabbis and priests. Of, of, of this narrative. I remember about 20 years ago, a friend of mine, Rabbi, Rabbi Lenny Schoolman, I was telling him, oh, we are so balkanized. You know, we have now mosques which are predominantly Bangladeshi mosques, Arab mosques, Turkish mosques, Albanian mosques. And he said, Faisal, that was the way we were 70, 100 years ago. We had German synagogues, we had uh, Polish synagogues, and if a German girl wanted to marry a Polish boy, it was worse than an interfaith marriage. <laughs> and I realized later you had, you had Polish Catholic churches, and Italian Catholic churches, you have Irish Catholic churches. And, and there is a, a definite cultural uh, sensibility to that. But after a generation or two or three, eventually an American identity which embraces all of those emerges. But that process requires a very careful effort, a sustained effort, an effort that understands the, the theological tradition, the orthodoxy of our fundamental faith. Because every faith mission has been faced with this challenge. Namely, I can phrase it this way, what are the eternal principles, the eternal teachings of our tradition and how do we interpret it in a different context, in a different here and now? When I came in the 60s, the talk was, how does Christianity, you feel it like Islam, whatever it is, deal with modernity? Well, modernity may be a new word for us, but it has always existed. St. Paul had to deal with how to translate Christ's teachings in the context of these Greeks, who are not Semites. They had a different, they have, you know, they were Stoics, they were Platonic or Plato, and the Greek philosophy was their work. How do you, how do you, how do you translate the Semitic outlook of religion, of faith, to a people who were rational, who were logical, who believed in philosophy? That was part of his work. And in uh, America, I've learned not only from my Jewish, and Christian, and Catholic friends, but also from the writings of important people. Uh, one of my favorite writers in the context of, 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 of integrating Catholicism into America was the writings of John, uh, Cor uh, John, John Courtney Murray, whose writings are among the most profound writings I've ever read in my life. I and mean, one of my ambitions to, is to take his writings, take his ideas, and just translate it into a Muslim context. Saying, oh, we Muslims have to deal with this issue, we have to look at this issue. But his writings are very, very profound, very meaningful, very important to the transition. And that is why, the, the, because of his writings, his influence, the American Catholic bishops actually were able to, to influence the Vatican and convinced the Vatican of the, of the American concept of separation of church and state. Because until that time, Catholics were regarded in America as agents of the Pope. There was a fear that John Kennedy would be, would be just, you know, uh, and he was directly asked that question, that as a Catholic would he be beholden to the Pope. Um, and, and what we're going through today are similar questions translated into our context. Are American Muslims here to, put, to plant Sharia on the White House? These are the kinds of things that people are accusing us of trying to do. 
and nothing could be further from the truth. The fact is that every religion went, went to a particular context, adapted to the political norms of that constant, of that particular state or context. So in a, in a monarchy, it was an absolute monarchy, where the religion of the king was the religion of the people, that's what happened. So if the king was Catholic, you had to be Catholic. If the, if the like what happened in England, when, when uh, blanking on his name right now, Henry, Henry VIII, you know, said, nah, I don't want to be part of this, I need to marry more than one, marrying one is not doing it for me. <laughs> so he started the Anglican Church. And until not so long ago, if you are English, you have to be white, Anglo-Saxon, and Anglican. If you're white, Anglo-Saxon, and Catholic, you're beyond the pale. So because the, the religion of the, of, the, of the king was the religion of the people. The notion of freedom of religion was not common. And religion adapted itself to the political forms of those societies. So you would have a Christianity or an Islam because of the political powers that were, adapted itself to that reality and acknowledged that as long as the king would, would, would grant the church or the religious authorities A, B, C, D, there was some negotiation along those lines. In America, what has happened? America is the country that established the concept of a, of a government of the people, by the people, for the people, in the language of Abraham Lincoln. And as Abraham Lincoln mentioned in his Gettysburg Address, you know, when he said, uh, four score and ten years ago, our forefather came this land, to establish a republic devoted, I don't know the exact language here, to the proposition that all men were created equal. In the context of his time, it was still a proposition. It was not yet a reality. So the notion that, that a state and a government and the nature of governments is something which is, a, which, is a, which is a work in progress that we all have to work to strive for to make it better is part of the American legacy and contribution to humankind. And the most important contribution, or one of them certainly, indisputably, is America's contribution to what we call democracy, a form of democracy that has been defined as the American creed, and, and, and through that, what, what I call a, the corporate model of a nation. Basically, the United States created what I call a, a government of a corporation. So you, you, the, the stock at that time was land, you had to be a landowner to vote. You had a president, a vice president, a secretary, a treasurer, like in any corporate entity. And in the beginning, you have to, you have to be entitled to vote, you had to be a landowner, because that was the stock in the company. So they created a, a, um, a corporate form where the stockholders, now it is an expanded of the citizens of the country, who will vote for that particular country, that particular government. And uh, this form of government has become increasingly dominant in the other parts of the world. The French Revolution, the American Revolution, had that as, as its legacy. And in increasing parts of the world today, we find countries and governments that want this kind of government. And when I look at the experience of, let's say, the Roman Catholics specifically, which had a, a set church with a set, set of beliefs, and how American Catholic bishops brought about a recalibration, if I can call it that, of the Vatican's position on the relationship between church and state, I see the same thing happening today in many Muslim-majority countries where there's a desire for the people to have this form of government, a government that is beholden to the people, not a government of the few, by the few, for the few. So this is another outcome of what happens when a faith tradition takes root in a country like America and in its ability to influence or play a role in reshaping the understanding on certain important issues such as church-state relationship, for example. Uh, this is again another one of the projects that I think is important for us in the Muslim world, and I myself have created a project to 
address this issue of what I call the, um, one of the pieces of unfinished business in the Muslim world of how to create a democracy in the language of Islamic vocabulary, just as John Courtney Murray did that, the language of Catholicism. So this is another example of how interfaith dialogue, interfaith learning, is extremely helpful and productive to all of us, and in the process advances what I call the cause of the dignity of every human being. I think I've spoken for more than uh, my half an hour or so. So uh, allow me to stop at this point, because I really want to take questions from you. You're a bright group of people, and Boston, to me, is one of the highest IQ places in the country. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Silicon Valley and Route 128 is the, uh, are the two kind of bells where you have the highest concentration of smart people, and I uh, would love to engage with people of First, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.